Hey YouTube, Ian from Big Rock Moto and Outdoors. So I've got another car review for you guys today. So this is a long-term real-world owner's review of the Toyota Tundra. The model that I'm reviewing today is a 2011 model. I bought this truck new back in 2011. I owned it for four or five years and then since that point I sold it to my dad I think around 2015 or so and he's owned it until now. So it's been in my family this entire time since it was new. It has 90,000 miles on it and today I'm going to give you the full review of this truck. So here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to give you a brief overview of Toyota's history with full-size trucks. Then I'm going to talk about why I chose this over the competing trucks. We'll look at the exterior, talk about the things I like and don't like about it. We'll talk about the interior, the things I like and I don't like. We'll talk about livability, practicality, and functionality of the truck. We'll talk about some driving impressions. Then we'll go into the dislikes and some issues that we've had with it. And I'll end by with final thoughts and talking about would I buy this truck again. Toyota's history with pickup trucks in the United States actually goes back all the way to 1968. However, up until 1993, it was just small pickup trucks that Toyota had. In 1993, they introduced the Toyota T100. Toyota knew that America needed a larger truck, something larger than the small trucks that they had. While the T100 seems small by today's comparison, it was actually pretty sizable back then. They offered V6 engines. They didn't have a V8 engine, and that was one of the reasons why it never became too popular. They did offer an 8-foot long bed, which pleased contractors and workers. The T100 of that generation is pretty legendary for its overall reliability and durability. The T100's final year in the U.S. was 1998. Now during this time, Toyota knew that America wanted even a larger and more powerful pickup truck. So in the year 2000, they introduced the Toyota Tundra. The 2000-2006 Tundra was pretty much a full-size truck, although again, by today's standard, it seems a little bit smaller. Toyota finally offered different cabs. You could get four doors. You could get a larger V8 engine, which was a really big thing, at least in the United States. And you started to see the introduction of things like leather upholstery and some higher-end features that truck buyers were starting to demand. It really wasn't until 2007 with the introduction of the current generation Tundra that Toyota really went full-size, full-American truck. So in 2007, the Tundra was all new. It was larger. It was more powerful. They did have a V6 and two different V8 engine options to choose from. You could get a standard cab, a double cab, or a crew cab. Toyota's marketing at the time really focused on the truck's durability, its toughness, and of course its towing and hauling ability, and how it compared really well to the American trucks of the time, which it really did. It was built very stout, it had very strong powertrains, and with Toyota's reputation for reliability, it was an immediate success. However, success in the full-size truck world is a relative term because they never took the market dominance that trucks like the F-150, Silverado and Sierra, and the Ram 1500 enjoyed. They did update the Tundra styling in 2014, made it edgier, made it more of a square style, and I think looked better than the 2007 to 2013 truck. However, the Tundra that you buy today in 2020 is really basically the same truck underneath as it was in 2007, and that's not a bad thing as we're going to find out. However, one thing that's going to keep coming through this video is how they really haven't kept up with their competitors in terms of refinement, luxury features, ride quality, and other factors. Okay, so why did I choose this truck over the competitors back in 2010, 2011 during that time? So at that point, I had a small trailer. Um, I did a lot of dirt biking, a lot of motorcycling, so I was always hauling motorcycles around. I needed to pull a small trailer and just do general truck duties. When I bought this truck, it was actually the first pickup truck that I'd ever owned. So at the time, I was very close to buying a Toyota Tacoma, but when I looked at the functionality, the features, and the hauling ability, and just overall ability of the Tacoma versus this truck, considering they were almost the same price back then, and we'll explain that, I ended up getting this. Now, since I've had this truck, I've had mid-sized trucks. I've had the Chevy Colorado. Um, I've also owned other full-size trucks, so I'll link to my F-150 review right down below here. But I've also had a GMC Sierra. I've driven all the other trucks, including the newer GMC Sierras and Silverados. I've driven uh, the older generation Titans, the one that they made back when this was made. So I have a lot to compare it to. Some other reasons I got this, I mentioned the value of it. So I think this truck, I think I paid around $35,000 brand new for this truck back in 2011. I also really like the resale value of Toyota trucks. They're incredible. They're some of the best resale of any vehicle you can buy in the planet. 
Another thing I liked about this truck and what I still appreciate about it is that it's built in America. It's always been built in America and the engine and transmission are also built in America. So it's not just the parts that are made here, but the truck is assembled here by American workers and that's something that I really appreciate. Even though Toyota is obviously a Japanese company, the fact that they do so much business in the U.S. is, is really a great thing. You could make an argument that this truck almost is more American than some of the American trucks, which oftentimes are built in Canada, Mexico, or other countries and then imported here. So the competitors to this truck are pretty obvious, right? You've got the Ram 1500, you've got the F-150, you've got the Silverado and the Sierra, and I suppose you can throw in the Titan as well, although unfortunately no one buys Titans anymore. Since this generation was brought out in 2007, um, even though it was pretty, really competitive and really awesome vehicle back in 2007, it still is an awesome vehicle, and we'll get to why that is. It actually has fallen quite a bit behind the competition in terms of refinement, in terms of powertrain choices, in terms of fuel mileage, in terms of interior quality and features, um, luxury features, and a lot of the things that modern truck buyers want. Now, where it still is ahead of a lot of those is in reliability, toughness, practicality, and just how well it works as just a truck. We'll get to this kind of later in the video, but if you want a truck that just does basic truck duties and you don't care about a lot of fancy stuff, and you want something to last as long as possible, you probably want this truck. Full-size trucks have become luxury vehicles with things like heated and cooled seats and huge navigation screens and moon roofs and power running boards and all sorts of fancy stuff that you can get. Now I'm the biggest offender of this. I own an F-150 Platinum and I'll put that link down below here. But when I get in driving my dad's truck, what used to be my truck, after driving my F-150, I really appreciate just how good it works as a, as a regular truck. As a, and I don't know how much I would miss a lot of the luxury stuff. I don't think I would miss most of it that much, to be honest. So let's talk about exterior styling for a minute. Now, as I've said in my other videos, exterior styling is completely subjective. It's about what your opinion is. I mean, obviously there are polarizing vehicles out there, some that most people agree look terrible and some that most people be agree look really good, but then most vehicles kind of fall somewhere in the middle. Now, when we look at the exterior of the Tundra, now this is the body style they had between 2007 and 2013. Obviously, like I mentioned in the history section, they did update the body a little bit in 2014. Uh, to my eye, these, these first generation of, of this version of Tundra is a little bit too rounded for me. The whole truck just looks a little bit bulbous and just a little bit too round on all the edges, but that's just my opinion. Your opinion may vary and that's fine. Some things I should mention about this particular truck. This was a package offered, I think, for only two or three years called the TRD Rock Warrior Package. And basically, it was kind of like an SR5 level kind of truck, um, a little bit lower than the TRD Off-Road, uh, and it wasn't up to the level of like a limited or something like that. But what you got was the Forge Toyota TRD 17 inch rims, uh, larger sidewall tires. You got different shocks, although the height of the truck was the same as the regular TRD. You also got blacked out fenders and some different styling cues. So it looks, uh, you didn't have any chrome, you didn't have any silver really. If you really have a keen eye and you know these trucks well, you'll notice that the rims look a little bit different than the factory rims. The only reason for that is that when I owned the truck, I took off the silver lining pieces on the outside. I'll put up a picture here. Um, but I unbolted those, they just come right off, and I think the truck looked a lot better without them. Let's jump into the interior impressions on the Tundra. Now, in terms of how this is held up, it's held up actually really, really well. There's a few tiny spots where the finish on some of the buttons is worn off. Um, you know, but overall, this, this interior has proven to be really durable over almost the past 10 years. And that's a good sign for the future because I know my dad plans to keep this truck for a very, very, very long time. Some things you'll notice about the Tundra interior is that they designed it uh, to use with gloves on. So you've got these huge climate control knobs, big four-wheel drive knob, the shifter handle is gigantic. And everything in this interior of this truck is just big, but it's also very functional. It's easy to clean. You always know where something is. And uh, the night, being able to use things with winter gloves on is actually a really nice feature. This is in stark contrast to how the controls on my F-150 work. On my F-150, the buttons are so tiny that first of all, you're not gonna use them with gloves. And second of all, there's so many darn buttons in that thing that if someone like my dad got in that, he'd be just way overwhelmed. So I guess what I'm saying is I appreciate the simplicity of design here. It's not luxurious, it's certainly not going to win any awards for luxury or features, but it's fine. Now, you have to remember, this was 2011 when this truck was sold. So you've got a CD player, there's no tape player, thankfully. Um, you've got the old school auxiliary input for the stereo. Of course, you know, if you own this truck, if I still own this truck, I'd probably change the head unit, put in a Bluetooth head unit. 
You've got basic things up here like a basic clock and temperature gauge, uh, but really the instruments are very simple, the readouts are very easy to use, and you just really won't have any complaints. The truck has a lot of really good practical storage spaces. Uh, the center console is, is storage is huge with lots of different compartments in here. It's got two glove boxes, which I think is great. Um, really useful thing there. You've got a lot of cubbies, a lot of cup holders on the doors. Storage is uh, really good in this truck and actually I think it's better than my, F my new F-150 is. In terms of seating comfort, um, I did a lot of long trips with this truck out to play out to uh, Colorado, like thousand mile drives and things like that. I found the seats to be really quite comfortable in this truck. Now, I don't often get along with seats in Toyota vehicles, but these were pretty good. Um, they're probably not as good as the seats in my F-150, but they do have good lumbar adjustment. I, I do think it's funny that the seats are all manual adjustment, which is actually kind of good because it's one less thing to break. Um, but the lumbar support is actually power, so I thought that was kind of interesting. But the lumbar support, I, I adjusted it on my drive up here to my house, and it's actually really, really good. Let's jump into the back seat. Okay, so now I'm in the back of the double cab Tacoma. Now the double cab is an extended cab in any other words, right? So what the nice thing about this layout of this truck is that you can get the six and a half foot bed, which is standard width, or you can actually get, you don't see too many of them, but you can get the double cab with a big full size eight foot bed, which is an awesome thing for many of you who are in construction or trades or just want the full size bed. Now in terms of leg room here in the back, it's actually really, really impressive for what you consider an extended cab truck. This is also another reason why the Tundra really convinced me back in 2011 um, to buy this. The leg room, the rear leg room in the double cab, and I've got this front seat pretty far back with plenty of room for the person in front of me. I've still got a couple inches in front of my knees and I'm five foot 11. The actual leg room is 34.7 inches in the back seat. Now I looked up the specs for the F-150 in the extended cab. Now granted, you don't see many extended cab F-150s, but that's what you would need to compare this to. And that has about an inch and a half less leg room than this. So, you know, that's a noticeable amount more in the Tundra. So really Really good packaging the Toyota got all this back room here with the extended cab still putting a six and a half up bed and still keeping the length of the truck uh, the same as the other trucks uh, in his class nothing else too crazy in here back here in the back you've got some cup holders to flip out you've got a basic 12 volt power outlet and uh, nothing else because you know what you don't need anything else but I will show you the storage under the seat which I like okay so let me show you the storage back here so the rear seat goes up and down just like this it flips up here towards the back of the truck and when you do this, you've got this nice big storage bin under here. I think this was an option, but I can't remember. But in any case, you get all this nice storage area underneath both sides. It's really, really, really handy. I really like that. And then just fold your seat back down. Super simple. Now, if you wanted a totally flat load floor back here, you could get it almost flat. You'd have to take these boxes out. One more quick thing I wanted to mention about the, the Tundra double cab, which I like, is that you've got a rearward opening door, or a standard opening door, right? So it opens like a normal car door, as opposed to some of the extended cab trucks still, where you have to open the front door first, and then the door is kind of like a clamshell opens backwards. Now that has some advantages where maybe if you're loading cargo, your door kind of flips back against the bed here. I'll put a picture of that. Um, my Sierra had that feature, but I think for actual everyday use for people getting in and out, um, the traditional door opening is actually better here. So let's talk about some of the practicality, usability, functionality of this truck. So I've mentioned a few things already. I really like the six and a half foot bed on this uh, double cab truck. It's a good bed size. It's not quite, it doesn't make the truck super long like the eight foot bed, but it's a heck of a lot more usable from someone like me who owns a five and a half foot bed on my F-150 with the short bed, although I do the bigger cab, um, I really, really miss having this longer bed. And if I get another full-size truck in the future, which I certainly will, I will be going back to the six and a half foot bed no matter what brand I choose. How about towing and hauling? So that's one thing where the Tundra has always really excelled ever since it came out. Now, yes, modern day competitors can brag that, oh, maybe they have a thousand pounds more towing capability, but you know what? That's really not that meaningful. And there's a few reasons why. When you see the advertised towing figures for full-size trucks or any vehicle, it's only going to be in a very, very specific configuration. Usually with the least amount of options, the lightest cab and drivetrain configuration and engine and things like that. So you really have to dig deeper into what the towing rating of a specific truck actually is. And a lot of times a Tundra will have a higher or at least equivalent tow rating to some of the brand new full-size trucks because of those things. The advantages that the Tundra does have is that at least with the 5.7 liter V8, it has, they all come with a 4.3 rear end. Now the 430 rear end means that you basically have a better gear for towing. Now combined with a really strong six-speed transmission, this truck is really, really capable for towing. 
It's very, very popular for people who tow travel trailers, RVs, or even small fifth wheels. A few other things I want to mention about it, turning radius. So when you own a big vehicle like this, turning radius is something that really matters. Now this truck has around a 44 foot turning radius. That puts it in between the Rams, which have around a 40, 41 foot turning radius, and something like my F-150, which is really bad at like 47 to 48 feet. Now, when I drive my dad's truck here compared to my modern day F-150, I really notice that, especially if you've noticed I have a really tight circular driveway up here in the mountains. This thing, I can wheel this thing around so much easier than my F-150, and that's something I really miss about this truck. So they did a really good job engineering the suspension geometry to allow you to get that um, steering lock. In terms of living with this truck, doing the maintenance on it, uh, reliability, those kind of factors, I mean, it's a Toyota truck, so what do you expect? It's really easy to work on, nothing ever breaks, hardly. And it's just a super really, it's just a really great ownership experience for the long term. So what are the driving impressions? How does this truck, dr truck drive? So I put about 40 or 50,000 miles on this truck and my dad has put the other 40,000 miles on it. Some of the things you're going to notice when you drive this truck is the engine in this truck is smooth, but it's not as refined as modern day competition. So What I mean, it has more NVH, which is noise, vibration, and harshness. Now, a lot of you older school guys or truck guys are going to say, I don't give a darn. Who cares about that? And you know what? You're right. It doesn't really matter that much. It's a little bit rougher. It's a little bit louder, but it works great and it never breaks. So what more could you really ask? The truck accelerates pretty strong. It's not going to keep up with, you know, the twin turbo EcoBoost that I have in my F-150. There's just no way. But it accelerates pretty well. That's partly to do with the 4.30 rear end, which gives it a pretty nice start off the line. I'll put up the power figures here. So you've got, you know, over the run of this generation Tundra from 2007 on, they had three different engines you can get. They had a V6, which I think they've now phased out. I'll put the power figures of that here. They had a smaller V8, which I think started with a 4.7, and then they introduced a 4.6. I'll put the power figures for those here. And then, but most people on a Tundra, I would say, are going to have the 5.7 liter iForce V8 couple things I want to touch on, the steering. So the steering in this truck um, seems kind of weird to be talking about that. I mean, this is not a Miata review or a Corvette review, but you will notice that the steering is really, really artificially light and doesn't have any feel or communication to it at all. Now, I, actually, some of you may not notice that because you just don't notice those types of things, but I do pay attention and I don't like the way the steering on this truck feels. How does the transmission behave? So I've done a lot of driving, a lot of towing with the six-speed transmission. The transmission in this truck is actually not made by Toyota. It's actually made by Azen. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I think Toyota chose it because they knew it was going to be a really durable, long-lasting transmission. And that's proven to be true because how many Tundra scale transmissions have you seen? Not many. The transmission shifts okay. It's not rapid fire shifts. It's not as, as crisp as some of the modern trucks, but it shifts fine. Some people have said in the magazines out there that it's kind of neg uh, negligent to sort of downshift when you want it to. Um, it's not terrible. I think it's just mediocre in that regard. It's fine. I think the main thing you want to know about the transmission is that it's going to be reliable and it's going to tow well. And I think it does both of those things really well in this truck. So what are some of my complaints about this truck from a driving perspective, but also from an ownership perspective? Um, there's not many things that I dislike, to be honest with you. Um, one big thing that does stand out is the fuel economy. Now, granted, fuel economy on a full-size truck or full-size SUV with a big engine is never going to be excellent, but this has really fallen behind the competition over the years. I'll put up the EPA rating here, but I think it's something like 1317 uh, on the four-wheel drive truck, which is, which is pretty, pretty bad. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, okay, if I get 15 or 16 miles a gallon, is that really much worse than 19 or 20 or 21 on an F-150 EcoBoost, especially if you get like the 2.7? Well, actually it is, because the smaller the number in the miles per gallon, the bigger percentage difference you're dealing with. So let me give you an example of that. If you go from, let's say you go from nine miles a gallon to 10 miles a gallon, it's only a one MPG difference, but it's a 10% difference in fuel economy. Now let's say you go from uh, 49 miles a gallon to 50 miles a gallon, right, on something like a Prius. Well, that's still one mile a gallon, but it's, it's, it's only a 2% difference in economy. So when you're dealing with something with low fuel economy to begin with, three or four points on that scale is actually a really big deal and will really change your fuel cost in the long run. 
I mentioned in a driving experience that this truck is a little bit louder, a little bit more unrefined. The ride is not that great. It's just okay. It's not as good as some of the modern trucks, especially not the Ram. The, whole, the entire truck is dated. That's not really a complaint against the truck. It's just the fact that they haven't updated it really seriously since 2007. The interior quality, the interior um, sort of build quality and refinement and and lack of luxury is, is getting a little bit out of date. But you know what, for a lot of you, you're not gonna care about that. And in fact, that might be a good thing for many of you out there. A Couple things that I do have in my notes here. Um, this was addressed later on in the Tundra's run, uh, but the fuel tank size. So this particular truck, back then, you could only get the 26 gallon tank. Now, if you've done any towing with a big full-size truck with a V8, and you've had like a small gas tank like that, you know that your range is, you're gonna be getting gas every 200 miles or even less than that. It wasn't until like, I don't know, 2015 or 16, somewhere in there where they give you the option of a 38 gallon tank. Uh, my opinion would be if you're looking at a pre-owned Tundra, that's one of the biggest things you should look at, especially if you're gonna be towing a trailer, is get a later one and get that 38 gallon tank. You're really gonna thank yourself, especially if, if you tow and haul things. Another complaint I do have is the nannies. What I mean is the electronic nannies on this truck. Now, yes, all modern vehicles have safety features, traction control, ABS, blah, 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 things like that. But what my complaint on this truck is they're kind of confusing and they're kind of hard to turn off. Uh, my dad in particular, he's not the most tech savvy person. Sorry, dad, if you're watching this. But he's had a hard time figuring out what buttons to push and what sequence and holding down to turn off the traction control. And then in four wheel drive, it has all these weird things like V-Track and automatic LSD, not that LSD that you might be thinking of, but uh, limited slip differential. And so it gets really, really confusing with that kind of stuff and can be hard to turn off. Another big dislike that I have with the Tundra, and I don't understand this really, is that you cannot get a locking differential in the back. Now Toyota will tell you that, oh, it's the electronic locker and it uses brakes to give you traction. Don't believe that. I mean, yes, there is some electronic trickery going on with it tries to break the other wheel when it spins, but in my experience, it really doesn't work. Uh, having had this truck and then having a Sierra and having an F-150 with an actual locking rear differential, huge, huge difference on the traction in the back um, using the real locker versus the sort of the electronic nanny that this thing has. So I wish Toyota would have offered, especially in the TRD Offroad or the TRD Pro, an actual locking rear diff. It's a really strange omission on Toyota's part. Final thoughts on the Toyota Tundra. My dad has great pride of ownership in his truck and I think he's gonna keep it for a very long time. And I think that's who the Toyota Tundra is for. If you're a truck buyer who prioritizes longevity, durability, and just basic functionality, and also something with really good resale value as well, if you do decide to sell it, the Tundra is an excellent choice. However, if you're a truck buyer who wants all the latest gadgets, the best possible fuel economy, and is willing to sacrifice some of the reliability that might come along with all that technology, then you're better served by looking at the Ram, the Sierra and Silverado, and also the F-150. The Tundra continues Toyota's legacy of extreme reliability, durability, and functionality. If you're looking at a new Tundra, there's some things to be aware of. They've improved the standard safety features on the truck. I really applaud Toyota for including things like adaptive cruise control, automatic high beams, emergency braking, and other features like that that I think are genuinely useful and improve the safety for you and your family. In terms of looking at the different trim levels, if I was buying a Tundra today in 2020, I would get the TRD Off-Road. You might be impressed by looking at the TRD Pro, but honestly, you're just getting a little bit longer suspension travel and some different wheels and tires. If you want to build an off-road Tundra, I think starting with the TRD Off-Road and then building it up with the parts of your choice probably would be your best bet. If you're more of a luxury buyer and you want the Tundra, they do have the Limited, they have the Platinum, and of course they have that 1794 edition as well. So ultimately, if you're willing to sacrifice some fuel economy and some of the refinement that the other competitors have nowadays, you'll be really well served by the Tundra and you just can't go wrong with this truck. I hope this review was useful for all of you out there. Thank you so much for your support and continuing to watch the channel. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Give the video a thumbs up. That really helps me out. And uh, ride safe, drive safe. We'll see you out there.